blaming consumers for the economy's woes. Let's have a look. Hello everyone, Florian Heiser here and welcome to another episode of Heiser Says. I've got my stein of coffee as always, and I thought we'd look at this article, which is essentially an analysis from ABC by Stephen Long, where they are blaming consumers for the woes of the economy. So how a consumer goes slow and a pile of debt is killing the economy. Because guys, you, you know, you selfish, selfish people, how dare you not take on more debt for useless crap? You know, how dare you prepare for tough times or pay down your credit cards or horrible, horrible consumers, bad, bad cattle, bad cattle. So on a warm weekend, Carol Solom greets a couple of regulars at a restaurant, Almond Bar in Sydney's inner eastern suburbs. A year or so back, the popular Syrian eatery would have been full. Tonight, empty tables are a sign of the times. Well, the re restaurant sector and cafe sector is one of the most difficult industries to succeed in a business. And it is, frankly, one of the first places people can save money. When you're trying to budget, not eating out is the easiest way to do it. To cook at home is even better. Pay your stuff from basics is even better again. And then you go even more crazy, you buy your stuff in bulk. But not Costco. Costco isn't, in, isn't cheaper than Aldi. We've looked into it. Uh, so I, I'm not surprised. You know? And it's not just that custom is down. Spending is slimmer, even among loyal guests. Oh, there you go. I mean, we've been here for 12 years now. Well, so this is an established business. This isn't just a fly by night. And the last 12 months have probably been the most difficult a way of customers not spending, she said. You know, right? You know, rather than two people getting a bottle of wine, they're getting a glass of wine each. That kind of thing. They're thinking twice about where their money is going. See, the, the smashed avocado and toast, guys. You got to do it to save for your houses. It's no isolated case. Consumers aren't quite on strike, but there's definitely a consumer go slow. Well, guys, you know, how have you been saving money? How have you been cutting back? Have you been spending as much? You know, I, I know we've, we've cut drastically. And for me, one of the things I really looked into as a way of saving money was all those just recurring expenses. I'm over the subscriptions. At one point, I thought we were going into a recession. To be honest, but I'd say it's somewhere before that, she said. Yeah, well, we're at a per capita recession. Very weak. It doesn't look great for, from a business point of view. Her assessment is on the money. According to the official estimate from the ABS, Australia's economy expanded at an annual pace of just 1.4% in the last quarter, the slowest rate of economic growth since the GFC. You have to go back nearly 20 years to find a weaker result. In the year 2000, when GST was introduced, leaving, the one, leaving that one-off event aside, the economy is the weakest it's been since the early 1990s. You remember that, guys? What, what happened there? Just around the time Australia, the recession Australia had to have. So, wage growth remains a massive issue. Well, wage growth pretty much doesn't exist. When you're in a business like this, you know, I, I'm surprised if she's still even to maintain, keep open on public holidays because the cost of having to pay your staff, a lot of restaurants will just shut. Will just shut because it's not worth it. So perilous consumption was one of the biggest, big drags in the economy, which is not surprising considering what's been happening with wage growth. It's been woeful. Yeah. The last six years have been the worst period for wage growth since the Second World War says Jim Stanford, Chief Economist and Director of the Australian Institute Centre for Future Work. Wages have grown so slowly, it's undermined consumption, it's undermined job creation, and it's contributed to, us, to Australia being the most indebted consumers of almost any country in the world. Well, there you go. There you go. The wage price index has managed to pull ahead of consumer price rises, but only because Reflecting the weakness in the economy, the inflation rate is extraordinarily low, extraordinarily low. If it doesn't feel like your cost of living is falling, though, and you're scratching your head at the talk of wages being prices, there may be a good reason. Here we go. 
because when you look at the ABS, when you look at the inflation, you know, the last video I did on it, you could see what was going up and what was going down because it's a basket of goods. And the basket of goods doesn't necessarily align with a normal person's spending habits. The price of many necessities of life, food, healthcare, electricity, and other utilities has risen strongly over many years, far outpacing average wage gains. So, you know, your food goes up, your power bill goes up, your health goes up, your council rates goes up, utility bill, that, that, that all goes up. And then, then you get a saving in domestic air travel. So that offsets it, guys. That offsets it. Those holidays you can afford to take when you're struggling to pay for your food and petrol and your electricity is offset by <laughs> just offsetting that other increase. That, that's how it works. But the baskets, basket of goods and services that make up the consumer price index also includes stuff most of us can only buy now and again. And people on tight budgets may just forego. The latest smartphone, for example, the new whiz bang laptop, the latest fashion clothing, or international travel. So this is fantastic. I'm really glad I've, I found this piece that is br bringing that to people's attention. So, you know, we've got our politicians, we've got our leaders making all these claims about the economy, but there's some fundamental issues with the data that we're being presented. And most people wouldn't actually dig into it. They'd only, only look at the headline. And then that's what they're making their decisions on. So here's the wage growth index. I mean, look at that. Look at that. And prices CPI. So yeah, that, that's way too close. That's way too close. These luxury items, discretionary spending and economists speak, are what's bringing down the inflation rate, either because such goods and services fall in price outright or because they cost the same or not much more for better quality, as recorded as price falls under the ABS measures. There you go. So if your quality goes up and the price doesn't go up, it's, yeah. See, see all these, these the issues with this methodology where they can be they can feel like there's a disconnect being what you, what's reported by the ABS, the media, to what your day-to-day -day life is. And I, it's, not, it's not intentional, it's not malicious, it's just a result of the methodology that's being employed. And that, that opens, part, you know, that leaves a gap in the market for maybe a, a CPI or consumer price inflation rate that's calculated slightly differently that has to do with, you know, simply a basket of goods that, encompasses your normal living costs. So back to the article, it means in effect that there's a bias towards the well-off people with a lot of disposable income and the cost of living. It all depends on what you buy, says Dr. Stanford. Yes, that, that's a really good point to bring to people's attention. The, reali the reality is that price, the price of many household essentials has been rising much faster than wages. So if you can afford to spend a lot of your income on luxuries, your inflation rate may well be lower than average. But if you spend most of your income on basic necessities, your cost of living will likely have risen more than your wages and your standard of living will be going backwards. Now I made a video about Australia's reduced standard of living and I will put a, car, a little link to it here at eight minutes and 30 seconds while I'm talking about, I'm writing it down here. I have to write it down so I remember to put it in. <laughs> Home ownership, a distant dream for many. House prices aren't included in the consumer price index. If they were, it would tell a very different story. Despite recent falls, the cost of buying a home has soared in recent decades relative to incomes, pushing the Australian dream of home ownership out of reach for many. Now, here's a question for you. If that was included in the consumer price index, if the public every month got a, a better understanding of the cost of buying a home, the cost of accommodation, how would that, how would that affect government policy? Because it would, it would even just by having it mentioned, it would affect government policy, it would affect consumer decisions. Interesting consideration. Soaring property prices also create a huge debt burden. On some measures, Australia's household debt is the highest in the world. On others, merely second to Switzerland. And that makes us very vulnerable. Oh, so we're, we're only second. Martin North of DFA, who has long warned about the dangers of Australia's high household debt levels, notes that mortgage delinquencies and the share of borrowers who aren't keeping up with the required loan repayments has risen significantly, even though the RBA's cash rate 
and bank lending rates are at historic lows. Here's the problem. Here's the problem. Even though cash rates are at historic lows, you may not be able to refinance. You may be able to ring up the bank and demand a reduction. Sure, they'll give you a little bit, but you're, you, if, if you're unemployed or if you know, business has slowed down, if you're in small business like that restaurateur, you may not be able to refinance to take advantage of those lower rates. I was talking to a broker the other day and he was telling people who were approaching him for refinancing opportunities that you know, he, was, he used to say to him, I can't even get you what you've got now. You know, I couldn't even get you your mortgage now that you have. They learn refinance you again. So that's the issue. That is the issue. If unemployment starts to rise, that will accelerate, he says. Well, yes. Yeah. Australia's unprecedented level of household debt have never been tested in a recession. But it's worth noting that in the last recession, in the 1990s, house prices fell in the order of 20%. If Australia were to experience mass unemployment at the level seen back then with today's level of household debt, Mr. North is among those who fear the consequences will be dire. Well, yes. Yeah. During the election campaign and the lead up to it, Treasurer Josh Frydenberg and his colleagues boasted of the strong economy, a claim which was not accurate even back then. The mantra then became that the economy is sound. Then as a, weaken, a weakening economy mugged the rhetoric, it changed from the fundamentals are strong, a phrase echoed by the Reserve Bank governor. The claims don't wash with Miss Salomon. I can't see that, she says. Nothing seems sound or strong from our point of view. Well, yes, the budget is sound. The budget is in surplus. But it's because of the spike in iron ore prices. I think for every $10 above 50, we get another 3.7 or 2.7 billion in the budget. There you go. There's plenty of folks who would share her feelings. Low productivity growth by historical standards doesn't sit well with the claims about a sound economy with strong fundamentals either. We're economy based significantly. Our budget is in surplus due to one, one product. One product. I mean, here we go, we'll jump to the, uh, you know, Observatory of Economic Complexity. Look at our exports, guys. Iron ore, coal, petroleum, gas. Iron ore now, this is a, a couple of years old. Iron ore now is 30%. Isn't that what a you know, banana republic is? Isn't that what Keating said? No. Mr. North and Dr. Stanford are among the many, <clears throat> many economists. <coughs> Pardon me, I need a coffee. Coffee. Mr. North and Dr. Stanford are among the many economists and financial analysts worried about the structure of the Australian economy, which relies heavily on two industries to sustain its momentum, mining and construction. So, you know, I'm going to pull up this quote here for everyone to remember. Read this article by Matt Barry about the House of Cards. The Australian economy is built on the House of Cards. He, in 2016, 67% of Australia's GDP growth came from Sydney and Melbourne, and 24% of that it's just in one corridor. And we all know what's happening to the building stock that came out of that, don't we? And we're dependent on mining and construction. You know, that ain't good, guys. That is not good. So we, we wasted all the wealth the donation took out of the ground and sold to China on buildings that are covered in fire rated cladding that people are getting kicked out of, that are built on contaminated land. Lots of good issues, hey? So both of these sectors have gone from boom to bust. And right now we have very little of the high tech export orientated sectors we need to drive, to drive growth, said Dr. Sam. We don't have any. Our economy, you know, and I'm, I'll bring this up again. We've got here, and I'll just scroll at the top. The economic complexity of our economy is 0.09. We're not very complicated. We're not very sophisticated. And that, that's to do, what are we? We're 59th in the world. Iron ore is one of the simplest technologically products to produce. So we are not an advanced economy technologically wise. People are saying Australia is such good inventors. You know, we invented Wi-Fi. And I looked into that. The, the Australian engineer that invented that was based in the Netherlands when he did it. So, I mean, a lot of it is just smoke and mirrors, I think. 
We invented the Hills Hoist. Great. 50 years ago when we had industry. Australia was. Was the first country in the world to ever cast a tank hull. First one. We're now a funny little World War II tank. Even before the Germans were doing it, before the Russians, before the UK. Australia was the first. But who, being first, it doesn't matter. My, my space was first. I bet you there's a generation that doesn't even know what that is now. So yes, many of the new jobs being created are not in high-tech export oriented sectors, but in a suite of industries that Mr. Refers, Mr. North refers to as the bedpan economy, labor intensive human services such as aged care, community care, and healthcare. Yes, and we've seen that in employment figures where the largest growth in, in, in employment has been in government healthcare. These jobs are not necessarily productive jobs. They're important jobs, but they won't tend to deliver high productivity growth, Mr. North said. My question is, where is the next generation of value in the economy going to come from? That's, that is the most concerning thing. That is the most concerning thing. Because are we just a quarry and a farm for the world? No problem. If we are, let's build some infrastructure projects, some good dams to capture some of the monsoonal rain and try and turn Australia into the food basket of the world. But no, we can't do that. It's bad for the environment. No, no. And now we're at a point where we've got bushfires all throughout Queensland. We don't have enough water to fight it. And I just read this morning, I'll, I'll make a video on it because it just annoyed me. We've also got uh, climatists Cult members are claiming that it's due to not providing enough sacrifices to their God. It just shows you this, this rhetoric is just, it's a bloody annoying nutcases. Probably a beer bottle smashed by some kids and dry weather that happens every hundred years. So how long can Australia, Australia's resilient economy hold on? In the face of the undeniable weakness, Mr. Frydenberg has not dropped the reference to a strong economy, instead describing it as resilient. That's a fair call. A world record 27 years without a recession is evidence enough. Australia has weathered the Asian financial crisis of the 1990s, the tech wreck of the 2000s, and the global financial crisis a decade ago without succumbing. But that record has involved some sound management and a lot of luck. I'd say most of it is luck. Most of it is luck. I mean, and also, you know, we wouldn't be, we weren't exposed to the tech wreck. So we couldn't suffer from it we also couldn't take advantage of it. Is there one, how many companies that you hear of that always end up overseas? How many? All of them. At some stage, the luck will run out. Alongside spluttering economic growth and household hunkering down at home, a series of risk, uh, risks lurk offshore. The bad Brexit, the US-China trade war, the underlying problems in the Chinese economy blowing among them. Any one of these could play us into GFC 2.0, said Mr. North. And if that happens, then essentially all bets are off. We're going to see very high levels of unemployment. We're going to see a lot of household defaults on their mortgages. We're going to have a spillover effect in the economy. That would hit the banks and take us down a very dark corner, in my view. In recent time, it's only been population growth that's kept Australia out of recession. Many people have created more demand but high immigrants, immigration has also helped to suppress wages. While the pie has been growing larger, the slices have been getting smaller, leaving aside the distribution of the pie, which is skewed towards the top. Those at the top. Per head, living standards have fallen. Yes. Yes, they have. A phenomenon that's been dubbed a per capita recession. The government and the RBA will be banking on the tax cuts which commenced in July and the interest rate cuts to lift the economy out of the doldrums. If we're lucky enough, things may start to turn around. But if that luck runs out, there could be far worse to come. So, I mean, we've got no innovative ideas here. We've got no innovative ideas here. None of it. If they move to QE, that's not innovative. I, I, I want to propose, you know, stealing Palmer's, one of his suggestions, allowing people to write off the interest on their primary residence as a tax deduction, rather than just giving tax cuts. That means more people can borrow, means we don't need a tweak with the interest rates. It means more people will stay in their homes. I'd rather we do that than go to QE. That's an idea. 
I think I'll make a video purely on that topic. Let me know what you think about that, guys, and let me know what you, where you think everything is heading. You still, are you still eating out? Are you still eating out? I know uh, Crypto Tim sent me a link to a, a crypto app where you can earn, earn crypto eating out. And, uh, you know, I haven't replied to him yet, but if you're watching this, mate, I'll let you know. I've got a family of four. We never eat out anymore. <laughs> when I take Rachel to a date, we go to Aldi, buy chocolate and salami, sneak it in her, in her handbag and eat that at the movies. <laughs> Maybe I'm just a terrible husband. Anyway, guys, like, share and subscribe. I'll see you next time.